Fashion loves change. Obviously, right? Anyone could guess that. Besides trends, the biggest sign that we just love switching it up is the great changing of the guard. New creative directors at major fashion houses. The biggest appointment that almost everyone heard about was Pharrell Williams at Louis Vuitton. Super weird. Ludovic de saint sernin just got appointed at Andy Mulemeister and Harris Reed just got appointed at Nina Rishi. Also worth noting is a few other appointments that are less brand new but still very relevant to this discussion. Maximilian Davis recently appointed to Ferragamo and Sabado de Sarno's rise to the top role at Gucci. And that's all happened in the last just like 15 months. Okay, so when someone is just appointed to that new position, the pressure's on, right? They they unleash the first show, the first model walks out, and if you check the live stream and then go to Twitter, you can see the hot takes rolling in about the collection before the show is even done. I guess we could get into the psychology of why human beings feel this need to do stuff like this, but what we're just gonna focus on is how we should be looking at a new creative director's early work, the first few shows that they start releasing at that house. Because whether you personally like these new creative directors or whether you don't like these new creative directors, all of these hot takes that are coming out, I feel have a pretty strong flavor of intellectual dishonesty about them. Here's the deal. When a new creative director comes into a house, they're usually new to that company. There's exceptions, obviously, like Alessandro Michele at Gucci, where he was the head of leather goods for many years before he became the creative director of the company. But generally, houses are just hiring people in from outside the company. There's a great demonstration of this in the documentary Dior and I, which covers the beginning of Raph Simmons' career at Dior, uh, obviously. <laughs> And there's a few moments in this documentary where we learn about how bumpy the start of this career can be. And I don't think anyone here who watches this channel is confused about whether or not I like Raph Simmons. I love Raph Simmons. So they're documenting his first day there where he is introduced to the Atelier staff in French and he's asked to give some opening words and Raph uh, graciously thanks them, tells them he's excited to work for them, and then he explains that he's just gonna continue in English because he's more comfortable in English. And this highlights one of the most obvious, biggest challenges that new creative directors can face at a European house, just language barriers. But if you're trying to communicate very nuanced, detailed ideas, the conversation can break down very quickly. Like for anybody who's watched the Marzella series that we do on this channel here, where I'm trying to communicate really detailed, very abstract thoughts about a specific garment, I sometimes struggle to communicate it in the only language that I speak. The memory of belt is introduced when the clothing hanger clothes are introduced with the jacket hung up on it. The sentence that I just said in any other context would make it sound like I was having a stroke. Let's let's listen to that again and, and actually follow what's going on here. But at one point, Raph has to pull the atelier manager, the woman who manages all of the sewists, into a room, into a private room, and explains to her, I was expecting that there would be 10 dresses available here today. There are no dresses that are ready. What's the problem? And she explains that the head sewist had to travel to New York to meet with a client. And he was like, I didn't know about that. Why are we taking trips that are jeopardizing whether or not this runway show are going to get done for a client? What? And they just sort of explained that's the way we do things here. And I think it's important to point out that neither Raf nor the atelier manager are in the wrong here. This is the kind of tension that makes really great companies great, is that there are different priorities and those different priorities buck up against each other and they have to argue and compromise and find a solution that works. The reason that this came to such a head in the documentary is because Raf is brand new at the company. He's been there for like a month. This requires a very difficult skill that a lot of people are just naturally super bad at called leadership and most creative directors fortunately are pretty good leaders but that takes time to develop a strategy for leading this specific group of people because the same strategies just don't work everywhere I thought this show was about fashion here is my point when a new creative director is appointed a house for the first few years that they're there, they are doing so much more than designing collections of clothes. They are learning to lead a group of people to accomplish a goal. And that's a hard thing to do, but there is a design solution to accommodating that roadblock. You start slow and you build up steam over time. Do you know why I wanted to make this episode? Mostly just because of the uproar of criticism that came after Ludovic's first show at Andy Mulemeister. There seemed to be thousands of longtime Andy Mulemeister fans just waiting for that first show to go live so they could immediately tear into it. 
Well, I like Anda Mueller-Meester, like the designer, the woman. I like Anda Mueller-Meester a lot. Besides the fact that she looks very similar to my mother, which makes me kind of naturally endeared to her, she's a genius. Her contributions to fashion are absolutely undeniable. You know what else? I was at Ludovic's first show at Anda Mueller-Meester, and I thought he made the right move. Like, if you're trying to compare a high-flying, excellent Anda Mueller-Meester show with a premiere show from a new creative director, then I don't know how to help you. The problem here is with your expectations. It's not with the collection of clothes that Ludovic put out. And to everyone who is gearing up right now to make a comment because of what I just said, hang with me, let me finish my point. I could just like picture so many people being like, that does it, he must be stopped. And this, by the way, is not a new idea for creative directors. The idea of starting slow and building up your aesthetic over time. Like, I mean, the first show from Alessandro Michele at Gucci started very, very slowly. The guy that did this and this and this, that guy started out very, very conservatively. Granted, he had to create that collection in a record-breaking short amount of time, which is a story all of its own, but his first few collections were not the torrent of references and wild pattern matching that he became known for. So let's shift gears here real quick and talk about somebody else. Maximilian Davis was recently appointed at Ferragamo to make their runways more than just we're an accessories company, right? His first runway show was great for laying a foundation that he can continue to build on. We even have a second show from him now, and you can see the speed ramping up a little bit. This is really good. I like these shows a lot. He's kind of trying to change up the idea of what does it look like for men to dress up? What does a man in a suit look like? And he's found a really cool vision for what that could be. And he's doing the right thing, but he's starting slowly. And to go back to Ludovic's and Mueller-Meester for a little bit, this is perfectly fine as well. I mean, the most common criticism that I've heard about this collection was people saying stuff like, but where are the clothes? Which I assume is in reference to this look that utilizes a hand bra look here. Like, where are the clothes? She's not wearing a shirt. Okay, so first of all, this is a reference to the and Mueller-Meester archive. It's a direct reference. And then also, if we're going to pull this thing of where are the clothes, I never hear, first of all, anyone leveling that criticism against Andy Mueller-Meester herself, and I don't hear anyone leveling the where are the clothes criticism against Martin Margiela and his first show where they also utilized hand bra or very, very little clothes. Quit playing around, Marty. Where are the clothes? Margiela is actually a great point of reference here because despite making revolutionary changes to the industry early on in his career, the clothes did take a while to get that distinctive Margiela flavor that we've all come to know and love. Like, I know this because I've spent a few years making making deep dive videos on each one of Martin's shows. And I love Margiela, and I love those early shows, but the real flashes of genius that made that house what it is, those flashes came slowly. And I know what I'm saying here is not particularly sexy, right? Like it's super fun to jump straight into something upon first seeing it and declare that it's either a classic or it is complete trash and should be burned. And, ah. But if we're wanting to have better conversations about fashion and wow, that is like my whole goal here, I think we need to approach this with a little bit more nuance. My personal strategy for this is that I consider the first four collections, which is the first two years of a designer's work to be that foundation building period and then after that is when I can start making real value assessments about the quality of the work. And I'm by no means taking the side of nothing is bad, everything is good. I'm just saying that our current expectations are unreasonable and they're honestly pretty unfair. And hey, look, I do this full time, not like this, like my, uh, my parents' house, but uh, I do this, the channel, full time. This is a business and we run this thing on a pretty shoestring budget, so I'm going to make a deal with you. If you derive value from what you see here, if you, if you get benefit out of these videos, I would ask that you consider how much that benefit is and that you put that benefit back into the channel so that we can continue to run it. You can put that value back into the channel by joining the Patreon. There's tiers that we already have set up. We have a $3 tier that's kind of the student tier. We have a $9 tier and we have a $30 tier for people who really believe in the project and what we do here. There's just a few people in that tier. If you wanna join it, I would, I would love you to death. But you can switch between those tiers. If you sign up for the $3 one, you can then upgrade it to $6 if we give you $6 worth of value on this channel. And to everyone who's already supporting the channel, you have my thanks. It means a lot to me. It really, really does. I really do want to hear everybody's thoughts about this. Let me know. Love you lots. See ya.